Hello, and welcome to our April History Round Bag. I am so glad you have joined us. I am Elizabeth Kellams, the City of Greeley's Historic Preservation Planner. Today, two Greeley Museum staff members will discuss local efforts to create and send care packages to troops in Europe in World War I, including how they were made and how they relate to packages sent today. Before I introduce our speakers, a few housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A feature for your questions and the speakers will take, take your questions after the presentation. This session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the city's YouTube channel at some date in the near future. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Katie Ross joined the museum's staff in 2012 and has served in several jobs in the collections department. She is now the curator of collections for the City of Greeley Museums. This presentation brings together her longtime interests in archeology span and history with her love of knitting and more recent trials into sewing. Joanna Luth Stoll began her career with the museums in 1995 as a historic interpreter while still a student at UNC. Since 2005, Joanna has served as the museum's registrar and annually can be found living in the Carpenter House at Centennial Village Museum as Miss, Mrs. Martha Carpenter. In March 2001, Joanna added Navy mom to her living history role when her son Jared went off to Navy boot camp. He is now a chief in the US Navy and is currently attached to the USS Kursarge. Joanna is a member and past president officer of the Centennial Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Well County Genealogical Society, where she is a two time recipient of the Genealogist of the Year Award. Katie? Hello, everyone. Let me get my screen shared for the beginning of our presentation. So I'd like to start our presentation by acknowledging that the City of Greeley Museums occupy land that is home to the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, as well as other tribes that have ties to this region. We recognize and celebrate the expertise of these tribes in stewarding their land, cultural artifacts, and histories. Greeley Museums is actively working to share power with Indigenous communities, prioritize their voices, and offer a more complete view of the region's past, present, and future. So the first part of the presentation is going to be a PowerPoint um, focused around homemaking in World War I and specifically knitting and sewing. So the briefest of historical settings to get us all in the same time and place, World War I happened from 1914 to 1918 and the United States entered in April 6, 1917. Um, there, two sides were the allies and the central powers. And just a note about the Ottoman Empire, the capital of Constantinople is now today Istanbul in Turkey. So their empire focused around the Middle East and Southern Europe. And the land-based fighting for the war was primarily in mainland Europe and throughout the Middle East. Um, and so this created very large refugee populations across this whole region. So on the U.S. home front, um, prior to the U.S. entering World War I, they had a, there was an isolationist policy in place, so they're trying not to get involved in other outside conflicts with other nations. And so what this meant was that once they entered the war, we had to really push getting everybody's support behind it. And I'll come back to this point just in just a minute. Um, so manufacturers um, in the US, you know, this is after the Industrial Revolution, so we have lots of factories and everything, but they were still at capacity and there was a um, gap between the supply and the demand. And so the American Red Cross um, decided to step in and try to fill this gap in the supply. And this was done through homemakers and small organizations throughout the US. And so, it's, you know, going back to the support, if there was no support for the war, then you know, the supply you know, wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have been produced in the homes and at a local level. 
So the American Red Cross um, was very standardized in their approach to this. They worked directly with the US government in getting the supplies needed. So for example, you know, wool was important you know, in very different capacities you know, throughout the war. And so they worked with the government and what wasn't directly um, used by the government was purchased by them and um, then further supplied you know, to homemakers. And the homemaker actually bought the yarn from the Red Cross, so the, um, at cost. So the government didn't purchase any of these supplies. It was essentially you know, local clubs and the people actually making the items that purchased the supplies in the end. And the Red Cross divided the US into different divisions across the country. So Greeley fell into the mountain division. They also set up control, quality control centers um, for items that were produced. So your local Red Cross that you donated your items to would send them on, you know, up the chain and they would, you know, be looked at for, you know, quality. And if they didn't meet the requirements, they were sent back to the group. And that way they knew what was going wrong and what needed to be improved because these were very critical supplies and they didn't want them wasted. If your local group did not improve, then most likely the Red Cross would not give you any of the raw materials needed to make these items. So that way they knew they wouldn't be going to waste. And so there was a lot of um, patriotism you know, put behind helping in these efforts. Um, on the initial slide, you saw the you know, couple of propaganda posters that were put out by the government and everyone was expected to help out. So for example, if you didn't know how to knit, you know, you're a young child, you could hold the yarn, you know, taut on your hands while your sibling or father, you know, wound the yarn into a ball. So that way, whoever knew how to knit in the family could keep on knitting <laughs> and they weren't having to you know, do these kind of more simple tasks to um, delay the production. It became a so, it's kind of a social statement to carry your knitting with you. Um, the images you see on the screen now came from a magazine called The Modern Priscilla. It was kind of a ladies home journal type magazine of the time period. And they also included patterns for making your own knitting bag. And they're really quite elaborate, so you could do it in style. <laughs> Um, the yarn was standardized that they requested you to use is either gray or khaki. And there was also logos that they had for you to sew on your official garments. And you can see some of those for the knitting here on the right hand side. So they were, you know, scarves, um, socks, fingerless mitts, what they call a helmet. I think it's also called a bataclava. And then the sleeveless sweater, which you can actually see flat there in the center. It's a long rectangle with some ribbing on each side and a hole in the middle. It did not have side seams even. So what all is all in common with these is that they weren't very fitted. They could fit a wide variety of sizes um, and still you know, provide the warmth and protection that was needed. One item in particular that was requested was socks. And this was because of the trench warfare that was going on. It was very hard for those in the trenches to keep their feet dry. And so they needed multiple pairs of socks to be able to change out so that way they could always have a dry pair. And then it was also requested to make the toe of the sock, which you can see on the left-hand side, seamless. The, they found that socks that had seams in them, that seam was enough to cause abrasion in the boots. And if you're having issues, you know, keeping your feet dry and care for them on their own, you don't want something that's gonna cause sores in your shoe by just wearing them simply. And so this technique of using the end of your yarn to weave through your stitches a certain way was done. Um, so that way there wasn't that bulk or seam at the tip of your toe.
And just to further emphasize the importance of socks, um, you can see here a sock knitting machine, and this is in our collections. It was purchased by the Greeley chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR, and they did specifically purchase it for making socks during World War I. And most likely um, sock knitting machines in the time period would be purchased by a group just because they were kind of expensive. And this way also, and the production of the socks, you could kind of have them going more um, at a time. And you'll see in just a second what I mean by that. Um, so how the machine, this particular machine works is the arm that you see with the cone at the bottom coming towards us in the middle photo, that would be rotated around and placed inside the tube of knitting and connected in such a way that would allow the item to have ribbing at the top. That cone is called a ribber. And so it lets you get the ribbing of your cuff made. And then you can just swing it back off and then continue down your leg of your foot. This machine also lets you just work a, a limited number of st stitches and just work those stitches back and forth. And why that's important is that for your sock to fit well, a heel needs a little bit more space in it. So working those limited number of stitches more provides a little pocket of space for your heel to fit into. And then it allows you to also um, work back in the round after you make your heel and go down the foot of your sock. Um, you do have to just take it off um, when you need to finish up your toe. So when you're working as a group or a club, you know, doing this, the person that's cranking the tube, you know, with the handle of the machine and making the sock can take it off, hand it off to somebody else in the group to finish up the toe and then start the next sock. So it would really increase the productivity if you did it um, with a group of people. The overall uh, sock knitting machine like this one would take the average time of about 11 and a half hours to knit a pair of socks by hand to just 40 minutes to knit a full pair. And it was estimated that 150 million pairs, so 300 million individual socks were needed to outfit soldiers with the multiple pairs that they each needed to help prevent the trench foot from setting in. And so going on to sewing, the articles that were knitted were primarily for the troops, whereas sewing items were distributed a lot more broadly. So the articles that you can see in the left photo are items that were made for those in hospitals. So there's some different types of bedclothes there. There's also some rolled bandages. And the ones down below are for refugees. So there's some kind of looser fitting pajama type style items and robes and things like that. So again, they could fit a broad range of people and sizes. Um, another item that we'll talk more depthly um, in our second part of our presentation were comfort kits. And here I just have the, the style for um, sending to the troops. There was a more simple style for those in hospitals. And the uh, Red Cross requested in 1917 that 2 million comfort kits be made um, for American soldiers in France and for wounded in hospitals. So what was the overall impact of all this homemaking? Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the statistics that the American Red Cross collected from across the country um, is over you know, 371 million items that were collected in total. So I'd say it's a big impact. <laughs> and remember that that total is over about 19 months. So April, 1917 to November, 1918. And you know, the Red Cross had to get people to pivot from not really supporting the war with that isolationist policy that was in place to being fully in and making things to help support the war. The um, upper left-hand corner has the, some statistics for what was created in the Mountain Division, which again was where Greeley was a part of. And 
And these are from January 1st, 1918 through August um, 1918. And around eight and a half million items were received. And those were valued at about one mil one and a half million dollars, which I think it's interesting to look a little bit more at that value. It doesn't include labor, which I mean, this was volunteer work, but still that labor and work has a value to it. So I did find a further breakdown of the costs um, for knitting. And this was a request of, um, there was a request of one and a half million sets of knitted garments for the army. And for this example, they decided to take a set to be a pair of socks and a sweater. So the yarn for that set cost about four to $5. And in total for the order would be six million to seven and a half million dollars. And that's in 1917 uh, currency. And so that would equate to about 122 million or 153 million uh, dollars in today's US dollar. And so they figured out what the labor would have been for this and how long it took to knit approximately each of these items. And so for this set of a pair of socks and sweater, would have been about 28 hours uh, per set. So about 42 million hours of labor total um, to fulfill this request. And they also further um, looked into what was needed to fulfill this order in two months. And that would have been 185,393 people working eight hours a day, seven days a week to get that done in two months. So now I'm going to switch over to the pre-recorded portion of our presentation. Just a second, please. And so this is um, going to show you a tutorial on how to sew your own comfort kit and then a comparison of what they recommended you to fill it with, but what an actual comfort kit or care package would be today. I chose to kind of go off of um, from what the instructions advised and I used the twill tape to bind all of the pockets edges um, and so if you want to do that and I'm going to show you how to you'll need about six yards of the twill tape um, you'll need just the recommended four yards in the pattern if you don't um, use the twill tape to finish the edge you can just fold over the edge twice, you know, fold it over a quarter inch, press, and then fold over a quarter inch again and press. That way your raw edge is tucked inside. You can finish it that way. Um, and then you wouldn't need as much of the twill tape. But just if you do that, when figuring out the measurements of your pockets, you'll need to add about an inch. If you just do, if you do a bigger seam allowance, you'll need more. I decided to add in a zipper. I thought it was a nice addition. And then you'll need some snaps for the pockets here. If you want, I just use one for each one. I just, and use the sew-in kind. Just used this kind of basic snap. So you can see I have my fabric cut out. I'm using a piece of 100% cotton canvas. And the overall width of the fabric that, um, how it was on the bolt was 59 inches from one edge to the other, which is a lot longer than what's called for um, in the instructions. You just need 36 inches of width. And so 
this is my folded edge here. And so this is my 18 inches half yard measurement of the fabric. And then once I fold this out, that'll be this 36 inches. And so what I did is I'm going to show you how to put in a zipper for one of the pockets. So with that leftover material that I had from my 18 inch um, wide piece, I just cut off a two inch strip, which is what you can see over here. So it's 18 inches long right now and two inches wide. And then once we cut out the, the measurements for the pattern, I'll measure this distance again and then cut this piece to be that that length to make so i'm going to show you the easiest and neatest way i found to do the corners for the interior pockets that you have to bind all the edges for and so you see i've done one corner here and i got this one partially done what you do is you back tack at the start when you start sewing you sew up and then i put a needle here a pin at the corner so that way I know where the corner is and where I need to stop to be able to rotate up and go off that edge of that corner so you can see here that's what I've just done and it's not perfect because I'm not marking the line you could just draw the line on there um, you can see easily through the white tool tape at least to be able to do that and so once you've sewn that first part, you take your fabric and press it up into that seam that we created by ironing our twill tape and press it down. Then pin it to place. Then you're ready to sew along this edge and you can see the shadow of the fabric behind this white tool tape, which makes it easier to show. So I'm going to so I'm gonna be sewing this way. So I want to put my pin just on the far side of where that corner is. So that way I can sew up to the pin and know that I'll be lined up if I come up to this edge. And for the zipper, you want one that's longer than your piece. So if you change, you know, decide to change the size of this, you just want to make sure that you have a long enough zipper that can go the full length of whatever this dimension ends up being. For the first step, we are going to take the, the extra piece on the two inch wide piece that's the same length as this and place it with our zipper right side up. And we're going to place the unfinished edge along the top. And it doesn't, I mean, you can favor one side or the other. It doesn't really matter. Um, just make sure that you know, both ends are going off. So you can press this end down and back. But I'm just going to hold it taunt and make sure that it stays taunt the whole way. And so really close to this edge and sew that down because if it stays loose, it, the fabric can get up into the zipper and make it catch. We don't want that. So once we have this side piece attached to our zipper, we want to attach the flat piece to the zipper as well. And you'll do that. So we need to line it up on this side, but as you can see, you can't see rear fabric is laying easily. So we can just open this all the way up, hold it in place so you know that you are still orienting it correctly. And we want to line the bottom edge of the fabric to our side piece that we've already attached. And then again, just hold it in from the edge of the zipper tape just a little bit and pin it in place. And again, sew up that edge. And I forgot to say earlier that I'm using a zipper foot because that lets you more easily get up closer to the zipper than what a regular presser foot does. So our next step, since we have our zipper fully attached to the fabric pieces, is to get this final edge attached down to the main portion of our comfort kit. 
And to do that, I already drew an edge, a line here, and that's a quarter of an inch in from each corner that the that's created with these flat pieces. And that's because when this is sewn down, we want this flap to be able to fold in really easily. We want to trim up our zipper ends. So you just trim it up so that it's just even with the ends of our fabric. However, before you do the top one, make sure to pull your zipper pulled down into your piece of work. Because otherwise, when you trim off that end, your zipper pull is gonna go with it. And you don't want that. <laughs> So you can see, I'm now ready to go into my corner here. And what you want to do is press your tilt weight down and hold it at the corner point there with your left hand. And then with your right hand, bring the twill tape and make a pleat in it. Fold it up on itself, which is sometimes easier said than done. easier to do when it's flat on the table. There we go. This one down here has a lot more space in it. And so actually what I did is I made this one flat, like I discussed you know, how it was on the diagram. And then all the other extra fabric in here, I actually created two little pleats and I just folded it under, tucked it under itself to gather up that fabric so it wouldn't be like puckered all the way across. So we have our completed comfort kit now. I have my snaps sewn in. And let's see, and um, these, I ended up using four and a half inches of twill tape for this one. This one ended up being a little bit longer, I think closer to maybe five and a half. So if you want a bow, you'll probably need a little bit longer there. And this strap, um, the very long one was about 36 inches. And there we go. Hello, my name is Joanna, and you have met me. I'd like to introduce my military family. You know that my son is in the Navy. His father was a Marine, and his grandfather was retired Air Force. So military in my husband's family, as well as my own, uh, run many, many uh, hundreds of years into the past where we both had ancestors who served in the American Revolutionary War. So today, though, we're going to focus on World War I with this beautiful uh, ditty bag that was made by our collections curator, Katie Ross, and pack it with some historic items, but also with some items that um, had to be substituted because of the fact that I just simply couldn't find anything that was appropriate. And then we'll take a look at sending a care box to a soldier currently serving um, in the military. So in the beginning, uh, with a bag that was prepared like this, uh, many women would uh, work on sewing something like this that would uh, have a, an economy of uh, space use and be lightweight and yet carry everything that was fairly needed for a soldier. One of the most important things was a sewing kit. The list that is historic with the pattern for this uh, ditty bag 
uh, calls for many things uh, to go sewing wise into here. Needle, thread, thimble, safety pins, specifically black safety pins, which are very difficult to find, I discovered, as well as buttons. Buttons to sew back on when you lost one off of your uniform. Well, I found a modern day kit that has all of that in it, plus a few more things. I'm not certain my son will use it. Uh, I suspect perhaps maybe his daughter will end up with it in her scout pack to be able to um, do the same types of things, repairs. I read in the be beginning of about World War I, the Navy decided it would be best to require that someone with sewing or tailoring skills could be on every uh, U.S. Navy warship. That way, when repairs needed to be made, they would have somebody knowledgeable in that. And it continues today where I understand uh, they actually have rooms set aside uh, for sewing with sewing machines. So perhaps you wouldn't really need a sewing kit like that, but it's always handy to have and in a convenient, economical little pack to put it in. The other thing that um, the Red Cross in 19, uh, uh, late 1900s wanted uh, to have in their flight were things like pipe, tobacco, and a pipe. Now, I found those cute little um, antique um, tobacco tins so that you can see what one looks like, but it's not very practical and it doesn't have tobacco in it right now. Um, and I couldn't find a, an actual space for that. So I imagine the tobacco that was put into this uh, 1918s era uh, ditty bag was probably um, in a, a tobacco pouch is what it's called for to put into this bag. I did find a nice little short stem briarwood pipe and I'll put it in here just for the fun, but my son doesn't smoke. So a, a sailor though to have a pipe uh, back then was important to their well-being. So I'll just set that aside over there for right now. Um, the other thing that I think uh, was a lot for well-being were the items that are called for um, on the list. Um, a mouth organ, I call that a harmonica, and I think that's a very fun idea and entertaining as well. I'm going to put that in there in this pouch and assume that my son will probably have fun with that. Another item was uh, writing materials. I'm going to add those as well uh, because you can never go wrong with uh, pencil and paper to make notes on. Uh, but for most part, uh, letters are sent home nowadays via email. Um, electronically, uh, a soldier will communicate with his family like that. He will also have games on an electronic device that he can play, movies that he can watch, books that he can read. But our 1918 list calls for playing cards and or other games. So I've included a deck of playing cards here so that um, he can have fun with those. Now, personal care items um, were also very, very important to have. And my son uh, will be receiving, uh, per the list, uh, some of these items, but not all of the items on the list. Now, another thing is that men um, just don't carry handkerchiefs anymore. The list calls for a couple of khaki colored handkerchiefs. Well, we found um, some bandanas that are appropriately khaki colored camo, and they probably will get used. So those are going to go into the, um, the bag here as well. Another thing was khaki socks and either hand knitted or machine made. Son, these are machine made. They're going to go in here 
And I'm imagining uh, my scalp family may utilize that pair of comfortable socks too. Um, keeping your feet, particularly for an army soldier, keeping your feet dry, clean, and having your feet be comfortable were key to, um, to your well-being. Another thing was a comb in a metal case. Comb in a metal case did not get found, but a comb made in America did. So we're going to add a modern day comb into there. Um, the list has quite, is quite extensive with having items for shaving, for men to shave. A washcloth, a uh, razor, uh, shaving cream, uh, blades for the razor. Now this is a very historic um, razor blade and I'm sure that we probably can't find blades for it anymore, but it's going to go into the pack as well, just for the fun as long and also with the washcloth, which is still um, an item that is uh, requested a lot by soldiers. And so we will be putting those in some, some of those in that box too. Another item that was on the historic list were uh, a spoon and a fork, I believe, and a knife, a eating utensils. Now out in the field, those were probably very, very needed and useful to have, but on board a ship, probably not so much. Um, many of these things that are going into this pack could be purchased on board the ship's store. Beginning in about 1896, the Navy decided it would be better to have their own ship store aboard um, so that their soldiers could have things when they needed them and not rely on what were called bum boats to pull up next to the find a Navy ship, first of all, and then pull up and offer goods for sale. And so today's um, uh, military have stores dedicated just to um, their access and their use stocked with things that they need and um, require to be able to do their job for us. Today, I would send a care package much like this, uh, one created uh, by my grandsons, Liam, Reese, and Cade for their Uncle Jared. Now you can decorate up a box like this to send, which is a gift in itself and, and helps with well-being and makes a soldier smile. Um, or you can just simply send a box. Um, the U.S. Postal Service um, supplies these boxes just for military use and offers a uh, military rate for mailing them. Uh, my son commonly will ask for things like coffee, creamer, coffee filter sometimes, hard candy. Um, he keeps uh, some of that on his desk to share with um, everyone. Now I say hard candy because chocolate melts, and so don't send chocolate. Also, when we send things like this off, we will always put them into uh, some sort of Ziploc bag to help protect them. And then also the Ziploc bags are, are helpful when they get to uh, the soldiers to be able to keep little things in as well. We also also send paracord along because he likes to um, keep his hands busy and he makes wonderful things like uh, the bracelet that I'm wearing right now. And as I mentioned, washcloths are an important thing um, to have and um, so we will be sending some of those along. Now, Postal Service has recommendations on what you can and cannot send and liquids, batteries, things like that um, are on that list. So before you pack your box, be sure that you are not packing something in there that is not, uh, not appropriate. Um, the post office also furnishes mailing labels and you will have to fill out a customs form that's best done at home and not standing at the post office. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed today our packing of our World War I uh, bag here for a soldier and also a current bag a box for a soldier rather, and that you will come and visit us at the Greeley History Museum and see our exhibit, War Comes Home. Thank you so much.
And I forgot to mention um, before I started that video that my tutorial was way too long for our presentation. And so there will be a full length version up on the City of Greeley um, YouTube page um, in the near future if you're interested in seeing that. We also um, have a, um, sorry, let me clear out another screen. Um, a link that we're going to, I'm going to put in the chat box um, if you want to download the instructions for making the comfort kit and the um, tips and tricks for creating a care package for sending to the troops today that Joanna put together. Um, and if the link doesn't work for you for some reason, you can also go to the greeleycalendar.com and find the um, calendar appointment for this event. And there's a link to be able to download it from there. So I will get that added while Betsy or Elizabeth starts up the Q&A. Thank you. Nice jobs, ladies. Those, those were fantastic presentations. And I don't see any questions in the Q&A. So if anybody does have any questions, um, you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. Or if you hover over the screen, that should pop up. Or the Q&A, you can type your questions in now. We're Happy to take whatever questions you might have. I'm not seeing any hands raised, nor am I seeing any more questions. So with that, I will hand it back to Katie to wrap it up. Um, so some other um, exhibits that we have going on at the museum right now, besides the work homes home that Joanna mentioned, is there's um, one on the time capsules that we opened last year at the end of the year for the 150th anniversary of the of City of Greeley. And then there's one also um, titled Unmentionables that talks about some the less seen items in collections. Um, and then you can find future brown bag events on the historic preservation website page um, for the city of Greeley if you're interested in those. And I see a Q&A that might have come up. It was a it was not a question, but it was a comment. Oh, okay. Sydney McConnell just commented that she much appreciated and enjoyed it and appreciated for putting it on. Okay, great. Well, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and we hope to see you at the next History Brown Bag.